And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C Show. Hey, man, don't forget about following us on Twitter. It's at Talking Boxing. That's T A L K I N P O X I N G dot com. Now, joining us right now uh, with his three favorite fights of the week, breakdowns and uh, predictions, my man Dax Khan. What's up, brother? This is a great weekend for fights. The last couple of weeks have been kind of dull, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this weekend. A lot of action worldwide, huh? Yeah, a lot of fights, a lot of good ones, too. Uh, not a lot of mediocre, but a lot of action. We're going to break down uh, this weekend. We're going to uh, break down three fights that maybe some people may not have uh, been looking towards, but I think you know, they're the most exciting fights, in my opinion. And I think they're going to be the most relevant down the road. You know, First, we're going to break down you know, the Scott Quigg against uh, Kiko Martinez fight, and then after that, we're going to break down uh, the McJoe Arroyo uh, versus... Uh, Arthur Villanueva fight, and then after that, we're going to break down the uh, the the, uh, the Ike Yang and against the um, uh, Quinnica. Okay, rock and roll. Well, all right, let's start out. You know, the, uh, Scott Quinn is going to defend his WBA Super Bantamweight title uh, against Kiko Martinez. You know, while Guillermo Rigondeaux may be the most underappreciated fighter at 102, 122 pounds, Scott Quinn is the forgotten man for whatever reason. You know, this is a guy here who's been trying, Bill, so hard to get into the mix as a big name, and he should. You know, uh, the pros about Scott Quigg is he's a great pressure fighter. He always comes forward. He hardly ever gets pushed back by an opponent. He has tight defense. It makes it real hard to land clean on him. Guys can land on Scott Quigg, but they never get a punch past that high guard of his, and he knows how to turn his body so they really can't end getting body punches in on him. You know, it's almost like a, a, a winky right type of defense, except he's holding it even tighter. Quigg, he knows how to break down his opponent slowly. He's never in a rush because he's confident and he's patient. He always remains himself. You know the issue I've spoken about over the last few weeks on several fighters, not knowing their, their character, not knowing you know, what style they want. Scott Quigg never fights out of the character because he knows what he's doing is working. He's had two draws because he tried to fight out of character. Those days are past him now. Quigg knows how to make his punches count. He rarely throws wild, especially when he hits the body. He hurts his opponents. He's a great finisher, and he gets his job done with timing. His cons are he has limited amateur experience. He has an uh, amateur record of, I believe it's 12, 10, and 2. So his experience is still being learned on the job. He doesn't have that pedigree. Considering he doesn't have that amateur pedigree, what he's done so far is quite impressive. But because of that tight defense, Scott Quigg is happy to allow guys to get off on him before he lets his hands go. That can cost him down the road against a mover who possesses a quality jab. Despite being an accurate pressure fighter, Valium sometimes drops when he sees that body shot dangling in front of him because he knows if he lands it just right, he's more than likely going to get that job done. Now across from him, we have Kiko Martinez, an established champion who definitely has the better resume. His key wins over Jonathan Romero, Jeffrey Matuba, uh, Hozumi Hasawagwa. He's only been stopped once, and that was in 2013 by Carl Frampton. The pros on him, again, is nothing but quality opposition. Like Scott Quigg, Kiko is a pressure fighter. Though unlike Quigg, who walks his opponents down, Kiko pressures guys with volume. Kiko likes to mix up his attack well. He makes it to the head and body, and he goes back up again. When he smells blood, Martinez is re- relentless in attempting to close that show. He goes after his guys with almost reckless abandon. He'll walk into guys with his hands down. He gets like this surge of adrenaline, as if he feels invincible. But on the cons on him, he's awkward. While that works to the advantage of some guys like a a Victor Chinian type, it's also a disadvantage when it comes to Kiko. He needs openings that can be capitalized on by accurate punchers. Remember, Kiko Martinez has been in with the Serramento team, the same guys responsible for building Sergio Martinez into a power-for-power fighter in his prime. Martinez was awkward, often left himself open. Kiko Martinez does the same. Just like Martinez, he used to hit the deck often and get back up. Kiko Martinez does the same. Again, the Frampton fight is the only one where he was stopped because he got overly reckless. When he goes for the finish, Martinez just stands there like a hunter who thinks he's got his prey unable to continue. He's going to go in there, cut the neck, and bring, bring his prey back to camp so everybody can feed on. Martinez, with no question, is the better puncher, but the, is, you know, the 
better opposition. That's a bad habit on him because when he comes in like that, Scott Quigg is going to use that short, precision body work, and he's going to stop Kiko Martinez. That's my official pick, Scott Quigg, by stoppage. He's going to retain his title. For some reason, I hope that these guys allow Scott Quigg into the mix. He's been calling out everybody for a long time now. As a matter of fact, he's actually picking Abner Maris to be Leo Santa Cruz. He wants to fight with one of them. Carl Frampton, his biggest rival, is fighting on the PBC this week. They should be fighting them together. Yeah, um, great job with that. I, I'm picking uh, Scott Quigg myself. And, and like you, uh, in a nutshell, Kiko Martinez is not a guy to fall asleep on. He's a, he's a talented fighter. He's got a lot of mileage on him at this point because he's fought the tougher opposition. And it is going to be interesting to see if his experience uh, can help carry him through uh, Scott Quigg. But uh, like you, I'm picking uh, uh, Scott Quigg. So who's the second, uh, second group you're going with? All right, now I'm going to go with the... Um Michoa Royal versus Arthur Villain, the wave of fight. That's going to be for the vacant IBF Super Flyweight title. You know, these guys don't get a lot of exposure like they should. I was hoping that with the Chocolito Gonzalez win on uh, cable a few weeks ago or a few months ago that, you know, this is going to really build up. But these guys always provide a lot of excitement. And, Bill, this is the type of fight that can help that division in terms of exposure. Michoa Royal. He's a former Olympian who had a stellar amateur career. Despite not winning a medal, he did great as an amateur, and he is well-developed overall. He's a good pressure fighter. He has amazing speed. Yes, all the guys at that weight are fast. But McJoe is even more amazing with his counterability that goes with that speed. Several times I've watched fights of his where he has let a punch go after his opponent has already started to fire a shot. McJoe Arroyo beats him to the punch, and he finishes them with the counter hook. That's exceptional. You don't see that very often, and he doesn't have to stand back and load up. It's a natural reflex with him. That's what makes the difference between a quality counter puncher and a great counter puncher. A great counter puncher doesn't have to think about letting his hands go. The cons on Mitchell Arroyo, while he is a great finisher and he does have that counter, he abandons his defense, much like I stated about Kiko Martinez earlier. Just... Arroyo is not the relentless finisher, Kiko Martinez. Arroyo gets a little over anxious at times looking to finish opponent, and he lets his hook go too wide, and it's easily countered. Remember, as again, I mentioned identity. McJoe Arroyo will switch up his style in the middle of a fight for no apparent reason. He's not adjusting to his opponent. He's usually winning handedly, considering he's undefeated. Obviously, he's always been winning handedly. And when he switches up his style, at times, if you do it, to the wrong guy, you're making yourself easy to beat. Guys, if you're out there and nobody can figure out why you're going to change up what's working, I mean, Joe Arroyo does that often. Arthur Villanueva is the type of guy that just might capitalize on it. Here we have a 27-0 fighter who is experienced. He's intense. He's a fighter who likes to assert himself from the bell. He's the boss in the ring. In his last fight, he dominated the former world champion, Julio Cesar Miranda. And he also has this one-punch power. He's done it on several occasions against top names. He fights well off the ropes. He's even comfortable there. He likes to stand on the ropes, lean back, and like a machine gun being loaded, he lets himself build up, and then all of a sudden, he brings out this rat-tat-tat-tat-tat, and then this big cannon size boom comes behind it. And usually when that happens, the fight's over. He never gives his opponent's time to breathe, Bill. Anytime his opponent slows down for a minute, he's going to pick the pace up more. One thing he does to do, he likes to do too, is wait for something simple to capitalize on. You don't see other fighters do. If a guy pulls his trunks up, or, you know, if they're going to wipe a little bit of sweat away from their face, Bill Nueva makes them pay for everything they do. There is no time to rest with this guy. He's dangerous from start to finish. The cons on him while he's intense, sometimes that intensity has worked against him. He gets too wrapped up in an exchange. He abandons his boxing IQ. Maybe it's the warrior mentality in him. I'm not sure. It cost him a knockdown against Ty Kieto. In his fights against Brick Trey and Mark Anthony Geraldo, he was cut from head clashes. He was so intense, he went in there recklessly and didn't think twice. And that is going to cost him one day down the road because if you get a clash of heads really bad or you get caught with a counter like that, if the right guy hits you, it's not going to work out. My official pick here, though, is going to be Dylan Nueva. He's fought the better competition, and he can make this the type of fight he wants to. His experience and his relentless pressure is going to bring him Joe Arroyo to a place he's never been before, and that's what's going to get him the win and the world title. Uh, wow. 
you know, uh, I, I, you break that down uh, really well because uh, Villanueva is uh, is a good fighter. And, you know, I officially am picking McJoe Arorio in this fight, but I'm about ready to change my pick because you make some great points about Villanueva. And, uh, you know, he is an aggressive. Uh, uh, I, I like the rat-tat-tat boom. I like that because uh, that's you're right. But uh, I'm going to go against you. I'm going to pick uh, McJoe Arorio. But you got me a scared. I'm a scared now, you know. But uh, it, it, it's that rat tat tat thing. I'm telling you, I, I've seen. No, no. Say it, like say it the way you said it. Say a. Say it. Say it the way you said it. Rat tat tat. Boom. That rat tat tat. Rat tat tat. Boom. Right. Like a cannon. You know, it looks like he shouldn't be on the ropes, but it's almost like a pressure cooker just waiting, 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 and he just lets go, and and they're accurate punches too, and he's not fighting out of desperation. He knows exactly what he's going to do in there at all times. That's what makes him so dangerous. But Joe Royal has never been in against somebody like that. Yeah, no, great point. I listen. I'm I'm sticking with my guy only because I I picked him, but I, you know I'm ready to change. I was about ready to you know every time I've done that when I go one way and then change at the last minute I lose. So even though you you made a great point and you got me uh, a scared here, I, I'm sticking with Arroyo. So we're we're at uh, different ends there. Now you're going with uh, Yang and uh, Quinza. What, what? Tell me about that one. All right, now eat Yang. You know, this guy's starting to make a lot of noise here. You know, he's not overly known, but, you know, people think he's going to be, uh, you know, a new Manny Pacquiao type. You know, he's moving from across the seas, and he's got a fan following there, and he's going to be looking this weekend to make a fan following worldwide. The pros on Eek is he's a puncher who possesses power in both hands. He has a long jab, he maintains the distance well, and he uses the seat well. One thing about him, too, is he's a switch hitter who can go from righty to lefty, but he does it effortlessly. He doesn't even realize it according to what his team says and according to what he said. And because he has power in both hands, neither stance is a disadvantage or an advantage for him. That's a special talent to have for a fighter, to be able to fight just as well and hit just as hard from any stance and be as defensive in any stance. The cons on him is he showboats too much. While it's great for the fans and great for the cameras, it's not good against an opponent that is seasoned. One day the showboating and trying to impress the crowd, he's going to find himself punching the mouth instead of hearing cheers. Eek has only had has only been to the eighth round once, and that was in his last fight against uh, Pat Pumpong. In that fight, he faded a bit around the fourth round. He scored a TKO win in the sixth, but the fact is, he did fade. We don't know if he's able to go into the later rounds, and we don't know his stamina. His jab is long. His jab can be used as a weapon, but he tends to push the jab more than snap it out there. So it's not really a weapon. It's just more or less something he does because he feels obligated to throw the jab out there. Now, across from him, Cesar Rene Kunica from Argentina, his kid, this man is a technician. He has the southpaw advantage. Now, a lot of people, a southpaw can be negotiated and neutralized with that straight right hand. Kunica style makes that lead right just another punch. He knows that ring well, Bill. He knows exactly how far the ropes are behind him without looking. He knows where the corner pad is. He knows how many steps it takes his opponent to get to him. Kunica's jab is fast, lightning fast, and he does it in rapid succession at speed you never expect. One of my favorite combinations by him is when he leads with his power hand. He'll lead with his left, and then he follows it with two piston-like right-hand jabs that just come one after the other, and by the time you realize he's even let him go, he's standing behind you, and when you turn around, he's doing it again. He also knows how to stifle opponents on the inside by smothering them. He circles them around, and then when he steps back, and they get off their clinch, he's already on top of them. The other fighter has no chance, like, any, like, like we were speaking about before, there's no lull in the action with him. Despite having only two stoppage wins, he actually drops guys with punches because it's the punch they don't see. He keeps them off their game, on, he keeps them off their game all night, and because he moves so much, he's never had to worry about an opponent's pressure, and power's never been an issue for him. The cons on him is this is the longest low of his career. Up until his layoff, uh, his last fight was in May of 2014. That's his longest layoff of his career. Prior to that, the longest layoff he ever had was eight months. We're not really sure exactly how this is going to affect him because we've never seen him with a layoff this long. Unless the power that 
It has, should be overwhelming. I'm going to have to go out on a limb and pick the right hitting technician in Cornica on this one. You know, uh, this is a 50-50 fight for me. Um, I, you know, I, I all, all along I was going with uh, Cesar Kunica, um, and and I, I think that the reason, because and, and not to mention, you know, the layoff is is a big issue, but he's also fought the better opposition. I mean, uh, there's no question about that. At least he's fought the more known opposition than uh, than Yang has. But I, I, I'm going with Yang because I feel that. He's got the home. He's got the home crowd, and, and I, and I just, I think that that's going to carry him through. And uh, I'm going against you on that one. Wow, we're we're uh, um, we're only agreed on one. So uh, I got uh, Quig. You got Quig. Uh, I think Arorio. You got Villanueva, and uh, I'm going with Yang, and you're going with uh, Caesar uh, Kunica, right? That's a, that's the, that's my official picks, and you know later on, you know you can send me an email and say I'm sorry if you don't want me to. I don't have a problem with that. No, that's we'll, all right. We'll keep that between us. That's all right. I, <laughs> that's all right. No problem. But uh, uh, great job as usual, Dax. Uh, on